Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I trust that you've had, if you're a father, a good Father's Day as it's now drawing to a close. I trust you've been spoiled a bit. Uh, for all of you who are joining us, wherever you're coming from, uh, welcome to our evening service. We're going to be online for a bit longer, but we are really grateful that we can at least broadcast this online. Uh, I am missing not seeing you at church. Unfortunately, I don't know how much longer we'll be like this, but hopefully at some point we'll be back in person. Why don't you join with me as we read from God's Word. We are in Corinthians. We kind of continue on from where we stopped last week, and we're in 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to read the first seven verses in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. No one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of worship, uh, working, but the same God who works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. We're going to pause there because there's a, a lot to unpack in the verses that come after that, and we're going to go through that a bit slowly. So I want you to join with me as we pray this morning. Our Father, we thank you for this time we can spend together. We thank you that you are present with us. We thank you for the goodness and grace that you pour out upon us. We thank you that as we worship you this evening, we can do so with hearts that overflow with joy and gratitude for all that you've done for us. And even though we are not gathered together, we want to pray that you would help that not to become a barrier to us being able to worship you this evening. We pray that you would be pleased with our worship, and we ask that your Spirit would be amongst us this evening. Glorify yourself, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Some of you may recall in 2004, the uh, women's Olympic rowing team. If you rem recall the incident, you remember they were rowing in one of the races where none of them were in the canoe. And the, as they were rowing, moving towards the finish line, suddenly one of the rowers just stopped rowing. She lay down. In fact, she became to know, be known as Lay Down Sally. And as a result of her stopping rowing, the team ended up finishing last in the race when they were hoping to finish somewhere in the top half of the race. After the race, there was great discontent. Uh, the captain of the team, uh, Julia, basically threw Sally under the bus and was very upset. There was great uh, angst within the team. Uh, she made quite clear, the captain made quite clear at a press conference that there was no technical difficulties. There were no uh, problems that came. It was just that this particular rower, uh, for whatever reason physically, couldn't do it anymore and just lay down. Now, in a rowing team, if you are going to function properly, Everyone needs to be rowing. In a sense, that's obvious. And that was highlighted by this one rower not being able to row anymore and causing great disharmony within that team. I think it took a long time before some of those rifts were healed in that team. But the reality is if you are going to be part of any team in any sport or in anything that you are doing, whether it's a work team that you are all working on a particular project or working together on something, everyone needs to pull their weight. 
I know that sometimes my boys said that when they were doing assignments at university, I've heard this from many different university students, and they were given group assignments, inevitably there's always someone, sometimes more than one person, who doesn't put in their fair share of work, and the rest become frustrated. Now what is true in those settings is absolutely true in a church setting. For us to function as a church, it's important that all of us together, as we are united in Christ, are exercising the spiritual gifts that God has given us, that we all pull together and we all work in the same direction. If one is going off in their own direction, it creates problems for the rest of the team who are working in a different direction. And it's important that the way in which we work is determined by Scripture, determined by the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have the right to choose what direction we're going to go in. We simply need to submit to God's Word, and we need to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to determine how our gifts operate and how we use those gifts together in the church. Now, the Corinthian church was having some significant issues. It was, in a sense, quite a charismatic church because what we would traditionally associate with charismatic gifts were being exercised within that Corinthian church. Unfortunately, the way in which those gifts were being ex exercised were causing all kinds of discord, causing disunity within the church. And so Paul has to write to this Corinthian church to correct some of these errors they were engaging in. Now, part of the problem of some of these errors were related to the fact of the ignorance that was there amongst the people. And Paul highlights that. Some of you have come from pagan backgrounds, he says. You've, you've come from a, a situation where you just don't know how spiritual gifts are meant to function. And so Paul writes this as an informative to this church to try and guide them, to try and help them to get their spiritual gifts working in operation with the, the Spirit of God and in consistency with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And what is true of the Corinthian church is no less true of us as a church. We need to ensure that we continue to maintain the things that we have been doing. And this church hasn't been a church where everyone's going in different directions. Thankfully, we are a church that are moving together in the same direction, where people are using and exercising their gifts and are working towards a common goal. And so it's good to be reminded of these things so that we don't lose sight and we don't get off track and we don't end up going off on different paths uh, on our own journeys. So number one, I want you to see the proof of spiritual gifts. And this is very important, the proof of spiritual gifts. Look at verses one to three. Now about spiritual gifts, gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. So if we can just pause there very briefly. Many of the Corinthian converts have come from deeply pagan backgrounds. They've been immersed in paganism paganism, immersed in secular religions. And so they've come from the way in which worship service, services occurred back in those religious settings. And so that's all they know. Now, now, Paul is not necessarily saying that they are bringing those religious experiences into the church. I don't think that's what he's saying at all. But what the Apostle Paul is saying, that's been your experience. And so that's all you know. And there is a sense in which there is not great knowledge on how a Christian church works and how different it is to pagan religions. And so Paul is wanting to say to them, this isn't an insult. I'm not trying to insult you by saying that you're ignorant. I'm simply highlighting the fact that you just don't know and are unaware of how within a church context, within a spiritual context, these gifts need to work. And so Paul wants to inform them. He wants to teach them. He wants to enlarge their understanding. Now, obviously, there are problems the way that these 
gifts are being perceived. And what's occurring in this Corinthian church is that they are elevating certain gifts above other gifts. And so they are giving certain prominence to gifts, and it's as if those people who possess those gifts operate at a higher plane spiritually. And Paul is wanting to dismiss that. Paul is wanting them to understand, if you've got the gift of tongues, because that was a particular problem in the Corinthian church, and because this is quite a a spectacular gift, that if you've got that gift, it is no more important, you have no more of the Spirit than the person who comes on a Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning and cleans the toilets of the church and vacuums the church. Those people equally have the same measure of the Spirit, and it's wrong to somehow create this two-tiered system within a church where certain gifts, because of the nature of those gifts, are slightly more prominently displayed and slightly more visible and seen by all people, as though those people somehow have more of the Holy Spirit than those who are operating in a very background sense. They were perceived that these were super spiritual gifts, tongues, that is a spectacular gift. Thus, Paul is going to make it clear what is fundamentally important is having the Holy Spirit or not having the Holy Spirit. So let me pick up uh, on verses 1 to 3. Verse 1, we've looked at it. Do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Now the point that the Apostle Paul is making there simply is that they used to operate within the setting of idolatry. And that's all they knew. Now they've come into a different setting, and so their understanding needs to be informed and enlarged. I've already said something, I don't want to repeat myself. Verse 3. Therefore, he has the point. Now, having set the scene, he says, Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul is not speaking about an actual situation that has occurred within the Corinthian church. So it's not that Paul is saying, well, some of you in the Corinthian church are actually saying, Jesus be cursed. But rather, Paul is raising a hypothetical situation. He is trying to say to them that if this were the situation, those who have the Holy Spirit certainly can't operate in a certain direction and say certain things Uh, by virtue of the fact that they have the Holy Spirit. So he is not saying that this is a test to test orthodoxy, that this is a way in which we determine whether or not we've got the right theology. Uh, Neither is this the test that is given in 1 John 4, verses 1 to 6, that gives a test about whether or not we know the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. What Paul is saying is it is a way to distinguish between those who have the Spirit and those who don't have the Spirit. In other words, the main point that is being made here is who is spiritual and who is not spiritual. And the way in which you determine the difference between the two is that they either have the Holy Spirit or they don't have the Holy Spirit. He is drawing a sharp contrast between what those who have Jesus say about him and those who don't. Now the contrast that he is drawing here, I want you to see, is not simply something that is based on words. It's very easy for us simply to reduce this to what we say or what we don't say. But rather what the Apostle Paul is trying to highlight is that those who are able to say Jesus is Lord are able to say that precisely because their lives are reflecting what they are saying. 
In other words, this is not simply a verbal expression that anyone can articulate and not mean. So someone can simply say, if they were pushed or asked, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? They can simply say, yes, Jesus is Lord. But then they can leave the place and they can live in such a way that indicates Jesus is, in fact, not Lord. And what the Apostle Paul is trying to say to this Corinthian church is if you are claiming that Jesus is Lord, then that will be backed up by the way in which you live. Because saying Jesus is Lord is not just about articulating a phrase, but is about putting into practice what that phrase means on a continual basis. And so there will be a consistency to you and a consistency to the way that you live. There will be uh, evidence of the fact that your life is being lived in submission to the Lordship of Christ as opposed to those who say Jesus is cursed. Because if those are, who say Jesus is cursed don't have the Holy Spirit, it is quite obvious by the way in which they live that they don't have the Holy Spirit. And so their lifestyle will become evidence against them that they have or don't have the Holy Spirit. Let me try and illustrate this. I remember many years ago having a chat with a pastor friend of mine. We used to meet up uh, 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 when I was in Brisbane, ministering in Brisbane. We used to meet up during the year and have coffee together and just chat with each other and, and talk about ministry and talk about spiritual issues. And the one time he said to me, Ian, I'm, I'm dealing with a couple who have been coming to the church and who uh, are claiming to be saved but are living together. And so when they came to me and said, would I marry them? I said to them, no, I'm not prepared to marry you unless you separate, unless you move out, unless you no longer live together and you promise to me that you will stop engaging in the sexual relationship that you are currently engaging in and you do it for a period of at least six months so that you can show me that there is genuineness to your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and that you are living out that commitment. And he said to me, they're unwilling to do that. Now that kind of a response of a person who says, I'm a Christian, I believe Jesus is Lord, but I'm living consistently in a way that denies Jesus as Lord is the equivalent to saying Jesus is cursed. And so Paul is simply saying, you can tell people who either have the Spirit or who don't have the Spirit. Applicationally. It has vital applications. Though the particular problem at any given church may not be about who is more or less spiritual because of the gifts given to them by God, it is nevertheless important to remember if we are claiming to live under the Lordship of Christ, it is much more deep than a simple confession of our faith. This does not mean it is unimportant to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. But what it does mean is that any such confession is backed up by our lifestyle. Christians, because of certain gifts on display, are not necessarily Christian just because they have the gifts. If their lifestyle doesn't correspond with the claim that they are making. It means if you are living in faithful obedience to the will of God, there will be ample evidence to show that you are living like that. Simply saying that Jesus is Lord, simply saying that you believe is not enough. And what is so wonderfully encouraging, I think, about these words is that when you are living in submission to Christ and your testimony does back up your words, it provides a sense of security in your salvation because it's telling you that the reason you are living like that 
is because you do have the Holy Spirit. It is confirmation of your status before God. Secondly, I want you to notice the distribution distribution of the spiritual gifts. Let's look at verse 4 following. And we're looking at verses 4 to 6 now. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, what's really interesting, I think, here is Paul doesn't give an exhaustive list of all the gifts. He is going to mention some gifts as he goes through the rest of the chapter. But what I want you to understand is we mustn't confine the gifts of the Spirit only to what Paul highlights. Because when Paul talks about gifts and he talks about service here, and he talks about ministry here, he talks more broadly than simply giving a list of all the gifts in this particular chapter. So what you need to understand is when you read through the rest of the chapter and you read it and you say, hang on, I don't see anything in there that corresponds to me. Maybe I don't have any spiritual gifts. You need to come back to these verse because Paul generalizes there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kinds of working, but the same God, different kinds of Uh, of gifts, but the same Spirit. So that Paul is trying to say there's a whole heap of ways in which God gifts us spiritually. There are a whole heap of ways in which God gifts us to be able to serve Him. And we mustn't get lost up in thinking that somehow, because the gifts that we have are not mentioned here, that we don't have any gifts. And it's really important for you to understand. Paul avoids to narrow a definition of ministry and gifts. He wants them here to grasp that diversity in gifts has nothing to do with status. It's so important that we understand that. Some gifts are by nature of their gifting just more visible than others. So when I stand up and preach to you, it is an overtly visible gift. If someone is up singing, it's an overtly public gift. But there are some gifts that are very different to those gifts. There are gifts where people work behind the scenes. There are people where no one notices what they do. There there are gifts where people get on and never receive any thanks because we don't necessarily see what they're doing. We simply see the results of what they are doing. So, for example, there are people who come here on a Saturday and they mow the lawn. Now, when you and I turn up to church on a Sunday, we turn up to a church that has a nicely mowed lawn. Or we turn up to a church that doesn't have any leaves out front because someone has come with a blower and blowed those leaves away. We turn up to a church whose carpets are clean, whose toilets are clean. But in order for us to have got to that point, there have been people who have been working in the background, making though doing those things so that the rest of us can benefit from them. Now, what the Apostle Paul is trying to emphasize here is just because we don't see what they're doing and they're working behind the scenes, their contribution is no less valuable than the contribution I may make by preaching up front. Just because God has gifted me in the area of preaching makes me in no way, in no sense, under any circumstances, any superior to anyone else in this church who is gifted with a different set of gifts than what I have in exercising this public ministry. Now, the reality is that because of 
the nature of preaching, James writes and says, if you don't presume to want to be a teacher because those who teach are going to be judged more strictly. And so there's going to be a, a higher criteria by which one day I am going to be judged because of the nature of the ministry that I'm exercised. Unfortunately, there's sometimes we elevate certain people because of their giftedness above certain others. And we give them greater prominence. And we ought not to do that. We need to remember that in order for the church to function as the church, we need all of the gifts to be operational. And even those ones particularly who are done in the background. What becomes important is not what gift we have, but rather the exercise of the gifts that we have and the exercise of those gifts by the power that God gives us to exercise those gifts. There are different gifts, but the same Lord. It is the same God, the same Spirit, who enables us to do what God has called us to do. And that same God doesn't put one on a pedestal and one somewhere down here. We are on the same ground because, as I've said repeatedly from this pulpit, and it is worth saying again, the ground at the cross is level. We all stand on the same ground before God. Therefore, we mustn't allow ourselves to get caught up in any kind of boasting about our gifts, in any kind of superiority feelings. I can tell you as a pastor, as I stand before you this evening, that I am so deeply grateful for those people who work in the background, who work behind the scenes, who don't receive the kind of prominence that I do, who don't receive the kind of visibility that I do. Sometimes I get embarrassed about the fact that I stand up up front and people see what I do. But there are people in this church who work tirelessly. There are people who come onto the property and do all kinds of jobs that no one else sees. There are people who give up sometimes their Saturdays. We have this video equipment put in here, and I don't need to mean to embarrass the person who did it, but who came and spent hours putting this in place so that we can enjoy these broadcasts. You, none of you saw the work that was done behind the scenes in that. None of you are here in trying to overcome the difficulties. We have people trying to make these broadcasts possible that you don't see that are working tirelessly to get this done, giving up their time. And I'm so grateful for people like that. People who come and clean the office uh, and vacuum and do the windows and do the dusting. People who stand at the door and shake people's hands. People who do all kinds of phoning around, phoning people to encourage them. Someone who, who has sent little gift packs, and you know who you are, who send little gift packs to different people in the church. My wife received one just the other day, a wonderful little gift pack, a gift of encouragement. No one sees that except the people who receive it, and yet they are giving their time and their resources. People who send encouraging messages to others who get on the phone. There's someone in this church who phones around a whole lot of different people. I'm so grateful for that man doing that. People who send SMS messages to people by way of encouragement. People who pick them up for hospital appointments. We have people in the church who, who take people who can't get to the hospital on their own and take them, pick them up and take them to their hospital appointments, sit down with them and help them as they go through the various diagnoses that they're given or the prescriptions by the doctor and help them to understand that and then take them home who work tirelessly. I want to tell you as a pastor, I'm so, so deeply grateful for them. 
because it's their work behind the scenes that enables this church to function. And without them, we would not function. So can I encourage you, and I really want to encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. The Lord sees and the Lord knows. And though you may not get the reward you deserve in this world, make no mistake, you will get the rewards in the world to come. I've often said to Janice, there are going to be people in heaven one day who no one has really seen what they've done in this world, who are going to get much greater rewards than someone like me. And I'm absolutely confident of that. And then thirdly, I want you to notice the purpose of the spiritual gifts. Verse 7, the purpose of the spiritual gifts. Look at the purpose. He tells us. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's so important that we understand that. Paul is saying that God gives us gifts not so that you and I benefit, benefit, them, benefit from them individually. It's not that you don't benefit from using your gift. You do benefit from using your gift. But that is not the primary reason why you use your gifts. Your gifts are used for the common good, for the common good of the body. And when we don't exercise our gifts, we are depriving the church of benefiting from the gifts that God has given us. We are withholding benefits that they need to receive. And so it's so important that you and I do use our gifts so that the rest of the body of Christ may be built up and may receive a blessing from the gifts that we have. Do you realize that your gift is there to bless others? It is there to, for their advantage. It is there for their good. It is there for their building up. It is there for their encouragement. And so as we exercise those gifts and as we use them, the rest of the body of Christ benefits from those gifts. Gifts are never meant for self-aggrandizement, never to be used for selfish ends, never to be used so that we have a little platform on which we can exercise our influence over the, the rest of the congregation. They are meant to help others. They are meant to benefit others. And so can I remind you and can I encourage you Use your gift. I know that some people say, I'm not sure what my gift is. And there's a way in which you can discover what that gift is. And one of the best ways of discovering your gift is to be able to ask others who know you well what they see as your gift. And most, in most instances, in fact, in almost all instances, there may be an odd exception here and there. Those who are closest to you will know what your gift is. They will have already seen it in operation. You may be using it without even realizing that you're using it. It may just help you to identify what that is. I've done all kinds of spiritual gifts workshops, and some of them are more helpful than others, but at the end of the day, what, whatever benefit we might get from those spiritual workshops, they don't always bring out the right results. So let me give you four blessings of using your gifts. Number one, Christians are blessed. Number two, the church exercises a powerful witness. Why? Because we have this diversity of people, all different, all working together, all working towards the same goal, all working towards benefiting one another. What a wonderful witness to the world. We are living in times where divisiveness has increased. We have families at war with each other. We have friends at war with each other over some of the things that are occurring in our society. It's tragic. We even have 
congregation, con- certain congregations at war with each other. My dear friends, it must never be that. Our unity in Christ, our working together, our exercising our gifts together, showing the world that as Christians, we can have a divergency of people, a divergency of opinion. We can have different opinions on all kinds of subjects, but in Christ we are one, in Christ we work together. That's the beauty of the church. It's a wonderful witness to the world. Third, when we all, when all exercise the gifts, it becomes apparent as to who has what gift so that we can then direct those gifts into the various different ministries of the church. And number four, there's a great sense of love, joy, and unity in fellowship. Let me say to you, believer, as you watch this, if you come to this church, Castle Hill Baptist, you have a gift, and you have a gift to contribute to the life of this church. And I don't care how great or how small you may consider that contribution is. I don't care whether it's an upfront one or it's in the background one. But whatever it is, you are vital for the working of this church. This church needs you to get involved. This church needs you to exercise your gift. The members of this church need you to encourage them and you to bless them with the exercise of your gift. Now, many of you are already doing this. I know that. I am so grateful for all of those who are exercising their gifts. And so I want to encourage you to keep on exercising those gifts. For some of you perhaps who are not sure or have been wanting to do so, but have thought, look, I don't really have a great gift to contribute. Can I say to you, whatever your contribution is, it is necessary for the working of this church. So please make yourself available and start using their gifts. I want to conclude with a story, a true story uh, of a church of a young man called Eddie. Now, Eddie Eddie was severely mentally challenged. He was mentally disabled. He loved to come to church, however. Over a period of time, Bob, the custodian, patiently had shown eager Eddie how to put the lights on and off after the services. Bob had turned, gradually, Bob had turned over to Eddie the full responsibility of turning the lights on and off. Eddie delighted in that job. Not only did he begin, did Eddie brighten the church with lights, he met everyone with a broad grin and a friendly greeting. Rain or shine, people could depend on Eddie to lift their spirits. He loved the Lord. And the people gave him opportunity to use his gifts in spite of his mental disability. Benefited from that. Everyone has a place in the church. Everyone has a contribution to make. Everyone has a spiritual gift. If you are a Christian, God has given you a spiritual gift. And it is our responsibility, our privilege, and our joy exercise those spiritual gifts for the good of the church, the common good of God's people, and to the glory of God. So can I encourage you, dear Christian, if you are exercising your gift, keep on doing so. And if you are not, there are opportunities for you here to exercise this gift in this church. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which you do gift us. We thank you for the many gifts you have given to this, your church at Castle Hill Baptist. We thank you so much for those who are using their gifts so faithfully and so diligently and so self-sacrificially. Bless them, Lord Jesus. May they know your blessing resting upon them. And for any who are unsure and perhaps don't feel they really have any great gift to offer this church, I pray that you would convict them and yet you would move upon them, that they would become involved in exercising and using their gifts in this church for the glory and honor of your name, whatever those gifts may be. For Jesus' sake, amen. May you have a great week that lies ahead, even though, as Kathy says, it's a bit like Groundhog Day. God bless you.